There's an attitude out there that says it is impossible to deny the evidence that's before your very eyes. Impossible to deny the evidence that's before your very eyes. And we're plagued in our society at the moment with a certain sort of atheism that is adamant that it is scientific. And that it is tangible evidence that it rests on, this atheism. Now, with as much respect as anybody could muster, I doubt it. And I doubt it because I see compelling evidence, not necessarily constitute what they call proof, what they would call proof within the games played by modern Western science and the rules of that game, that Jesus Christ is the real thing, that he's God the Son, that he's come in the flesh, that he's died on the cross, that he's risen from the dead, that he's gone back to glory and he's sent his Holy Spirit into his people who are around about on earth and the changes in them are such tremendous evidence for the whole deal. Scientific atheism has to rule out certain sorts of evidence to get away with what it's doing. And I'm saying, having the evidence before your eyes isn't good enough, doesn't engender faith and following in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, see, my, my atheistic friends, and I'm glad to have atheistic friends, uh, they just don't see the implications of these same observable phenomena as, as I see, and as perhaps as many of us see. And they seek to deny those phenomena because of the implications of those things. If that's true, whoa, there are some big implications for me. And that's, I find that frankly disappointing. Here's my point. My point is this, it was always like that. It was always like that, because in the passage that we're looking at today, in Matthew 28, 1 to 10, there are two groups of people. On the first hand, two distressed, disappointed, possibly disillusioned women, that's the first group, see exactly the same things as a full guard of Roman soldiers, that's the second group. In fact, it looks as if the Roman soldiers saw more of Jesus raised from the dead than the women did. Because the women turned up after he'd been raised from the dead and gone. They'd been there all night. They've seen more than those women. But the women are prepared to mix their observations of reality, what they see with their own eyes, with the possibility of faith and its implications for their lives. Does that make sense? It's not observing phenomena, seeing things that marks out the different responses. It's a willingness to live with the life-changing consequences of the faith that's justified by them. And that's never more true than when it comes to the issue of, of Christ's resurrection from the dead. So, so let's have a look at these women. What did they see? Well, verses 1 to 8, first of all on the scene comes the messengers. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, there's the women, they went to look at the tomb. <clears throat> and there was a violent earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning. And his clothes were white as snow. Just a coincidence I put on a white shirt this morning. But his, his clothes were radiant, shining through, white as snow. And the guards were so afraid of him, they shook and became like dead men. The guards were so afraid of him, they shook and they became like dead men. Now those hardened Roman troops set as guard over the imperial prisoner, Jesus, so that his followers would not come and steal the body as a precursor to violent millennial insurrection they saw exactly the stuff that these women saw, more than that actually. But the women here were open to the implications of faith. Look at the different responses to the presence of God in, in that messenger of his. First of all, the guards. guards. Who were these men? Who were these men, Kelly? The guards. The guards, Romans. Absolutely correct. Now, there were lots of different sorts of soldiers kicking about in Palestine at the time. There were Jewish soldiers for the temple guards. There were all sorts of little, you know, groups and stuff like that. But these, these are going to be Roman soldiers. Because they killed Jesus. Yeah. And that means that Jesus is an imperial prisoner. And we know anyway from the Gospels that the Jewish leaders had gone to Pilate and said, give us a guard and set a guard of your soldiers over the tomb because his followers say he's going to rise from the dead we're afraid they're going to come and steal the body. <coughs> so 
so from AD 6, so throughout Jesus' life almost, Jerusalem and Judea was under the control of Roman governors. And it stays that way throughout his life. And we know those governors kept four cohorts. A cohort was usually six centuries of, of 60 to 80 soldiers, so about 360 or so uh, in a group, 400. Kept four cohorts, some cavalry as well, in a place called Caesarea Maritima, which is up the road. It's uh, the Roman provincial capital of that area at the time. So there are uh, six, uh, four cohorts up the road and one cohort in the Antonine Fortress above the temple in Jerusalem. But every Passover time, and this was a Passover time, because of the trouble that was likely to happen, the governor came to Jerusalem with more cohorts. And they're temporarily quartered in the Praetorium, which is where Jesus was mocked and beaten by the Roman soldiers. They were generally recruited from Syrians and Greeks. They spoke Greek as their primary language. They, they were not Latin speakers. Their senior officers were probably ethnically Roman or Italian. They're good quality. They have to be because Palestine is a troubled place. Particularly tough posting. There was always trouble. So these men were well used to the more brutal side of life. As an occupying military force. So what sort of soldiers have we got in the passage? The high priest persuaded Pilate to seal Jesus' tomb. Breaking that would be a, a refusal of, of imperial authority. Seal the tomb, and then they said, give us a squad of these Roman soldiers. It's in Matthew 27, 62 following. Now the crucifixion of that particular victim had been quite unusual. All sorts of portents in the heavens, so tensions are high. Unusual events taking place. An earthquake, a darkness, and a tearing of the temple veil. It's looking a bit dodgy. So which sort of soldiers are you going to choose to guard his tomb? It was a little bit dodgier than that from the authorities' perspective, because the man they just executed was one of those millennial rebellious preacher types who had a history of inciting the people to rebellion. There had been lots of them like him. And worse still, this one not only had a huge following in the troubled country of the north, but a significant following amongst the pilgrims who were throwing Jerusalem at that time for their Passover festival. What sort of soldiers are going to take to guard that tomb? And to cap it all, he promised them, this preacher, this Jesus, that three days after his crucifixion, death and burial, he would rise from the dead. Now, if you were Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, what sort of quality of soldier would be, you'd be looking for to guard that tomb, Caleb? The best. The best, good answer. Trouble is clearly expected. And since their failure to guard the tomb could result in their execution because they'd lost their prisoner, the chief priests later were going to find it necessary to promise to use their influence as Pilate to protect them if they would lie about the events that actually took place on that day when Jesus rose from the dead. That's exactly what happens in the verses after this passage. Go for it. But surely, Romans, if they failed, they would fall on their sword. Yeah, if you didn't get to them first. So, so why would they, so why didn't they just fall on their sword? Like the Philippian jailer. Yeah, in Acts 16, yeah, absolutely. Well, why didn't they just fall on their sword? I think they were in a bit of a state, and we'll see that in a minute. They were in a state of terrible shock, and they really weren't thinking clearly because of what they saw. But we'll come to that in a minute. When the reality of the prophecy-fulfilling power of God dawns on them, as the angel rolls away the stone from the tomb, and the very earth itself is shaking at his presence, this shining, bright, glorious being, these hardened and, and battle seasoned troops why don't they come to the rational conclusion that they must have been mistaken about Jesus? Because they don't. They just don't believe the evidence that's before their eyes. And like generations of materialists before them and since them, they refuse the evidence of their eyes because they will not change their lives. Verse 4, the guards were so afraid of him, that's the angel, that they shook and became like dead men. So they're not thinking straight, they can't. They're in a state of absolute shock. Absolutely. And they're not those sorts of guys, because we've said already they're going to be the best. And then verse 11. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city, reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. 
And when the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money. And so killing them. Telling them, you say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. Cock and bull story. And if this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. The evidence is going one way, but their personal self-interest is too strong and takes them another way. <clears throat> And that story, says Matthew, has been widely circulated amongst the Jews to this day. The presence of God through his messengers is scary to God's enemies. What did they see with their eyes? What did they see that scared them? What did they see that they were somehow unable to acknowledge? There was an earthquake, another earthquake, because there had been one at the crucifixion. And now there's been one at the resurrection from the grave. And behold, it says, a great earthquake there was. And then they saw the angel. Sounds a bit like Yoda, that, doesn't it? A great earthquake there was. Greek's a bit like that. It sounds a bit like Yoda some days. Well, an angel of the Lord appeared. An angel of the Lord, just an ordinary angel of the Lord, as far as ordinary angels of the Lord ever go. And there's a very good description of him, which tells us quite a lot. After the earthquake, you see, came the angel. And the angel shone like lightning. Can you look at lightning? Uh, okay. Very, very bright, isn't it? Mm. Mm. Like the sun. And then there were his threads, what he had on. It's like he's got this glorious being inside him, and, and it shines out through his clothing, which is as white as snow in the diffuse light of the radiance of the angel. Don't get a lot of snow in uh, Palestine, except on the mountain heights. You can see it away there in the distance. It's on the highest, highest land, and it's another world up there. It's this bright, shining stuff as the sun bounces off it. And, seen from the valleys below. It's, a, it's, it's something from another world is snow like that. So how did these guards respond to what they saw of this angel with their own, their own eyes? You'd guess they fell on their knees and worshipped the almighty God whose mere flunkies were as glorious as this, wouldn't you? Verse 4, the guards were so afraid of him they shook and became like dead men. They saw the evidence, they were scared by it, a lot of people are. They did not believe, but carried on the same as they were, just more scared. Surely if anyone had evidence for faith, it was them. But, in the words of Romans 1, 18 following, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. There's the problem. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. Actually, that's, that's um, all about Paul's response to widespread homosexual activity in the society of his time. Is that? So it's a bit contemporary and a bit relevant at the moment, but that, that discussion is one for another day. The point for the time being is that in his wisdom, God has left things set up in this world so that those who wish to can find sufficient evidence for faith or suppress the evidence they've seen and the truth they should already know. It's not on the basis of science. It's not on the basis of intellectual objection, but on the basis of their preference for continuing to live the way they are. And in a sense, you can understand that. Because human beings are quite insecure, but we feel more secure with what we know and what we're used to. And that's a lot of it. That's evidently what we see in these soldiers. So the angel of the Lord is scary to God's enemies who, in spite of the evidence, persist in unbelief. 